Good morning. First off, how are you doing? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. So are you, you're in the Swamp Rabbit Cafe right now? Yes, I'm in the basement. It's, uh, it's probably difficult to find a quiet place right now around the Swamp Rabbit Cafe. Is that the only quiet place there? Uh, well, we have a basement and then we have another area we call the dungeon, which is like another basement lower than the dungeon. Um, but they do, we do some like maintenance things there. So there's probably some drills or hammering occasionally. Oof, we don't need that during a podcast, but I am <laughs> very excited to talk the story of the Swamp Rabbit Cafe because right now it's the end of 2022 and I was at the Swamp Rabbit Cafe about two weeks ago and it is packed. I mean, y'all are doing mm -hmm. incredible, but I got to imagine it hasn't always been that way. So for you, when was the first idea to open a grocery? I'm sure you don't mind, didn't even have a name then, but when was the, the idea born to open a grocery? So probably sometime in 2010, me and my friend, Jack Oliver, she's my um, co-founder and co-owner. We work together at a nonprofit called Upstate Forever. And they're, non, they're an environmental nonprofit and I worked in the clean water department and she worked in the land trust um, department. And we both had a passion for buying local food and we would go out of our way to get local milk or get local vegetables. And we would be at the Saturday market. Um, and we found that it was really difficult if you wanted to try to eat as much local as you could, you really had to be committed. And so the idea kind of started there where we felt like there was a big need for a one-stop shop to get all your local meat, produce, dairy, eggs, et cetera. And so we started talking about the idea kind of based on an, a need we identified and something we both just really wanted for ourselves. But um, and then as we got planning, you know, we started thinking, well, you know, it'd be nice if there was a cafe that also used all local food and a good bakery that made everything from scratch, you know, and then our idea is, well, then we can use stuff from the grocery. And that's kind of how it all came together to be the core of the business now. But you think about that idea. It's not a simple idea. Like, it's not like you're opening just like a retail shop or something where like you're focused on kind of one type of consumer. I mean, you have tons of moving parts. Did, was that overwhelming at the beginning or did you have any experience with purchasing? It doesn't sound like you were really with your job beforehand. No, and I always jokingly, but like there's some truth to it. And I always say that when we started the business 11 years ago, we were both really naive and had no idea what we were getting into. And that's part of how we were able to get into it. Because, you know, our smarter more experienced brains right now would say this is really risky. This is going to be 80 hours a week. Do you really want to do this with your life? Um, so it kind of worked in our favor in the end. Um, but uh, that's kind of probably what helped us um, get through in the beginning and end up making it happen. With the, the idea being born, y'all talking about just wanting to find a better way to have local food, local produce, local milk, eggs. What was the next step? Did y'all start looking for a location? How did you find your location? Yeah, so we, we knew we wanted to be near downtown, but we couldn't afford to be on Main Street. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't really even try to look there. And um, to me at the time, I was a passionate ride my bike everywhere kind of person. And so I really wanted to have a place that was safely accessible by bicycle. And the word safely is really important because a lot of roads around here are like a, a death trap, you know, for sure. cyclists or even pedestrians. And so I would ride the trail all the time. And at the time, the section of the trail we're on had only like just, just opened. Um, and so I saw this property and it had been empty for a while. And it kind of turned out a lot of like good luck and timing turned out we knew the person who had bought this property and he bought it. It was just a community do-gooder. Um, he bought it because someone wanted to turn it into a scrap metal yard. And like having a scrap metal yard on a newly opened community bicycle trail, like he didn't want that to happen. So he really just bought it to keep it from being that. Um, and then we approached him and said, we want to do a grocery store. 
And so long story short, he became our mentor. He fixed up the space for us and we rented it for him from him. And he became, his family became our biggest customers. What so. was, it look, I mean, the building has to be pretty darn old. Do, what was the original use of the building? So funny thing is our building, I, I believe it started out as a meatpacking building. I think that was the first use. And so in our, the, the grocery section, a lot of the walls are like three feet thick um, wow. and it's insulation. So it's all these insulation, insulated rooms, I think in the 1930s and 40s, um, so they would process animals here. And then the train used to run right alongside. So I think, I think that's how it works. Um, and then over time, another building was built, a joint. So our building currently is three buildings built at different times, joined into one. We have like seven different levels in our building. There's all these ramps mm -hmm. and we call them cattle ramps, but I don't know if they were actually used in that way. Um, and then after, after the processing, I think it was an electrical distribution building and some warehouse, but then it had been abandoned and condemned in the years before we opened it. When y'all got it, I know y'all's, I guess, process or the space has evolved since y'all opened. Um, mm -hmm. When y'all originally opened, what did y'all have to start? So we had 1,800 square feet and we did everything in that space. And we had zero That's not employees. a huge space. No, it was really tiny. So two people <laughs> could run it. Um, and so we did, like Jack did most of the ordering and communication with all the vendors. And we pretty much started out buying from every farmer at the Saturday market um, and everyone we could find. Um, so it was a lot of like work to you know, get set up with everybody. Um, and then I did most of the baking and menu development. We all took the registers, we all checked in orders. Um, and then, you know, just like everyone, when you're opening a business, like you expect to open in the spring of 2022 and you actually open in like, the, the winter of 2022. And so we opened much later than expected. And Jack, my partner, was pregnant. And so she had a baby about two months after we opened. Dang. Uh, so that was hard. I call those the dark ages. What was, no, what was your mindset then? Did you, were you overwhelmed? Did you think maybe we, you know, went too far? Like, we don't know what we're doing. Like, did you have any second thoughts during those times? No, I think I think that's where the our youth came in and it was like I just knew we were gonna make it and I you know, we just worked nonstop <laughs> and I never felt never felt like we were gonna drown. And and I think that helped because you know, if you're just too naive to know that you could fail, you just mm -hmm. keep working. Yeah. And you don't have that, you know, downside bugging you. Um so I think that works in our favor. We just worked all the time really really hard and just got you know pushing kept trying to innovate and getting more employees as we grew so. you you mentioned you are the baker or you did a lot of the baking did you have any experience <laughs> doing that before i didn't so i just did a lot at home and um my mom is chinese she grew up in Brazil. Um, so I felt like I was exposed to a lot of unique types of cooking and just cooked a lot to help growing up. And then I just studied engineering in school, which you would think wouldn't help. But I think in the end, like I was able to make spreadsheets to help us scale recipes up. And I actually think that helped a ton, especially, you know, when I went on to have my baby. Yeah, I couldn't be in the kitchen running numbers every day. And so being able to manipulate a sheet that allowed a baker to put in like, I need to make 30 stones. This is my recipe. Um, and I don't know if there was software out there that could do that or if it was like we were on a shoestring shoe budget. Um, so I think all of my life experiences definitely helped. Um, Very cool. In I through. I currently have my wife, she's trying to make bre bread. So I have a question coming later about making a starter and if you have any suggestions for that. But <laughs> the very beginning, did y'all have customers? Like what was that challenge to get customers in the door? I think luckily enough, we didn't struggle too much with getting customers. I mean, in the beginning, we were definitely slower. Um, but it, 
you know, it was only me, at, you know, at times. <laughs> so it wasn't like payroll was a big hole. Um, but I think because of word of mouth, and I think the community was really eager to go out of their way to support a small business, new business that was also trying to do good and buy from local farmers. Yeah, And so I felt like right from the beginning, we had a lot of people, the community bringing us furniture or even like um, helping hold our babies so we could go to the bathroom. <laughs> it was like a real community effort that helped us get by. Dang, I wish I knew the first time I went there. It had to be probably like 2012 or something like that. Um, and I do remember y'all's first original space. It was so much tinier, but I remember it always being very crowded. Um, even, <laughs> even back then, is there, how many vendors or how many people do y'all purchase from now? So it's like an ever changing number, but the last time I counted, it was over 300, um, like individual people that we order from that are local or regional. How, how do you, how do you keep that all together? So it's really hard. And then we, <laughs> I think we have a lot more payroll dedicated to buying than okay. a typical business. Because, you know, if you get everything from like two giant vendors with um, sophisticated computer systems, like ordering could probably be done in a couple hours. But because we're going to offer, uh, you know, order coffee from this person and coffee from that person. And then all those people, they have, they change their availability every season, you know? And yeah. so we just have a lot of people buying and you know, like, even I'm still involved in the buying and probably will be forever. It's, just, <laughs> it's so unique. You know, it's not, it'll never be cookie cutter. Yeah, it is. I mean, when you walk in, you do feel it's, it's like a family in there, even with your other employees, you know, other than you and Jack, it's, I don't know, y'all, y'all definitely created, you know, something special, even for the customer to come in and feel like, Hey, this is, very unique in its own way is what was the next step after you had 1800 square feet i'm sure y'all were growing um what were y'all figuring out to do next like pretty much our trajectory of the our you know to where we got to now is a little bit of building space would become available and then we would take it over and clutter it up and then more <laughs> building space become available and then we would take it over and clutter it up. And so actually it's just this year, finally, that there was the bike shop above us mm -hmm. and he went off and got his own location somewhere else. And that was the last bit of the building that was still being used by someone else. And we took it over. So um, do y'all so have kind of the full building now? Now we do, yeah. Very cool. How much is the square footage of it now on the inside? I think we're at about 10,000 now. Dang, that's so much more. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> what was it like when, like how many employees do y'all have now? We're at about 115 to 120. What do you do, you and Jack do, or your other managers to create like the feel or the friendliness of your workers there? Yeah, I. that's a great question because we we're lucky i think in that we didn't set out thinking we have to do this but i think it just happened naturally and i think part of it is that jack and i are here every day still and we're very much hands-on and involved still and i think that really helps employees who work for us they see who we are they hear our story and once we got to a certain point of growth, we started having an orientation for new staff people to make sure they knew our story, what we're all about, where we came from. And I think that that really helped set the stage for people to know our mission, why we're here. Um, and then I think, you know, because we started out as really community oriented, you know, you meet your milk farmer, everybody's interacting with each other, the customers, customers are unusually really nice too like every time we have a new person come here from another establishment they always comment within the first few weeks mm -hmm. how different the customers are here and I don't know exactly what it is I mean I think everyone's buying good food they're doing a good thing um, or they're exercising and riding the trail and they feel great yeah. like I think all of those things kind of 
combined to make it make our, our employees be more happier. You're right. Like day. a lot of those things you just mentioned or like what, you know, scientists or people that study happiness or good feeling would say create like happiness or good feelings being outside being social being felt like a family like all that sort of stuff just creates a good attitude so y'all have that all meshed together um, in your business when was the first time you were like oh my goodness like we really have something here like this is we have you know thousands of customers and just like being really busy did how did that evolve for you I don't know if there was one turning point that made us think that, but it could be maybe when we expanded to the grocery. Um, that was when we kind of doubled our square footage. And then um, we immediately were able to buy so much more and sell mm -hmm. so much more from our farmers. Um, we just had a little produce room prior to that. And then we got a produce room and cooler and all these like, and it was a scary expansion because it was very expensive. Um, and then just created that many more vendors and products to manage. Um, but it definitely like we did see the immediate impact as people had more room to shop and vendors had more room to display their stuff. Um, so that was when probably we got a lot busier. We had more growing pains. Um, we were hiring people at a much higher rate. Um, and so I think just, you know, it just changed the things that that we had to worry about. Everybody. Yeah, for sure. Once you get bigger, I mean, you have more things to, to worry about. That's just the nature of growing. Mm -hmm. When did, did the COVID, did COVID create y'all's outside checkout? Yes. Um, during COVID, we, we did a lot of things. And actually, like having our complicated business of like food service and retail, like it, it creates double the work. Um, but during COVID, you know, our cafe business, pretty much came to a standstill mm -hmm. and we were making pizza and we just completely stopped doing that but we were able to repurpose everybody the grocery got really busy because people still needed food um, so we repurposed most of our food service staff to either make prepared meals in the kitchen or to go to the grocery um, and work there because it was busier um, and then we didn't want people waiting in line inside a confined space so one day we just moved the registers outside. Um, and then it was kind of a joke for a while because every day, like, you know, we were we would be trying to find the best location. You know, we would put it on the deck, but then the deck, if there was a line, it got too cramped. So we started rolling it down the deck. And for for like a few weeks, employees would show up to work and they would be like, where's the registers? Like, they wouldn't even know where they were that day um, until they find found their current resting spot, which is under the awning. Uh, yeah, but it was a really quickly evolving thing. And y'all created almost like it's more space for products. And like y'all's coffee stand, yeah. I know, is, is still there. Or Y'all have some sort of like production stand out there with it. Was that part of the evolution? Definitely. Yeah, everything was. And like some people still didn't want to go inside, you know, for a while, understandably. Yep. So we did put, I think we started out just putting some strawberries outside. Yep. Um, and then this is just like our, our inherent skill is we're really good at cluttering up spaces. And so, <laughs> you know, every day we just put a little more and more out, um, until it's pretty much jam packed. So one thing I think y'all have it on the inside is y'all Stecca bread. Hopefully I mm -hmm. pronounced that right. And it is your creation, which is mind blowing because it is so freaking good. Talk mm -hmm. me through that how you brought it into the cafe so i was making it at home and it's it's kind of an easy recipe but it also is not because it just takes much advanced planning and time mm -hmm. you know and i would just make it at home and we made it at home and my husband and i were like this is delicious you know <laughs> and i would just mix it the night before by hand and then we would eat it like you know regularly and then at some point in our first year, like we were slow and I just made it at the cafe and then we had customers come and they ate it and they like wouldn't shut up about it. They like, kept raving about it. So it's like, all right, well, maybe we'll try to make this every day. But, you know, for the first year, I think I was one of the only bakers or, you know, maybe there were three of us. Mm -hmm. um, but then as we started making it, you know, there, the demand for it increased. Um, so it just 
pretty much grew. It's kind of famous in Greenville, I think. Yeah, which is really cool. And I love like <laughs> our favorite thing in the or my favorite thing is seeing like a little toddler just eating Stecca right out of the bag. And the Stecca is like, <laughs> as tall as the toddler. And I have one day we should do like an art gallery uh, opening with pictures of kids eating Stecca because it's just really precious. Yeah, and I mean it's delicious, so it makes sense. What it doesn't have to be for Stecca bread, but my wife is currently trying to figure out a starter for. I think she's doing sourdough bread. Do you have mm -hmm. any recommendations for a starter for bread? Like to make her own starter from yep. scratch? Yes. Yeah, it's it's so easy, and we don't we don't make sourdough here at a store. We we don't really have space to make it any to make it. Um, but I do make it at home and, um, there's lots like King Arthur has a great sourdough recipe. Um, and it's just, you have to feed it every day for two weeks. What and about the, the flour? Is, what flour do you use? So you, I think it could be, I think for start, if for starters, um, for starter people making starters an all purpose flour is perfectly fine. And then I think cool. once you get that down, then if you want to get more complicated or play with different flowers, then you should. But I think for, for beginners, like a regular King Arthur or Bob's Red Mill, all-purpose flower works great for, for beginning starters. Nice. All right. So I know Stecca bread is a lot of people's probably like favorite or thing they talk about most at Swamp Rabbit Cafe for you. What is your favorite thing on the menu? Like, what do you love the most? That's a funny question because um, I will have a favorite and then I'll eat it every day for a few weeks and I get mm -hmm. sick of it and then I switch to a new favorite. Um, and so I don't know. My, well, right now we have a lentil chili soup and that's probably what I'm eating almost every day. Um, but we also have, and it, you know, this is soup season, so it's just my current favorite. Sure. Uh, I'll also sometimes I'll go like weeks without really eating any Stecca and then I'll have it, you know, again, and I'll, I'll remember like, this is really good. Um, so that's kind of fun to experience, you know, over and over again. <laughs> um, and like this morning, our family had scones for breakfast, uh, which we don't do too often. Um, what type of scones? I, scones. Um, I always, I love chocolate. So I always go for chocolate chips is always a winner um yeah, some blueberry scones are some of my favorites yeah blueberries are most popular <laughs> what is next for you guys um right now we're trying really hard to make this location work as efficiently and um well as it can and like we've been approached there was a while where i felt like once a month someone would approach us with a new building and they wanted a tenant. And a lot of them were really appealing offers, but we know like in order to keep the business special right now for where we are right now, we would feel like we would need to be there. And so I think we've been really good about resisting the urge to do a second location um, to make sure we got this this one down. Yep. Um, so for right now, that's what we're kind of focusing on. and. I think we wouldn't rule out a second location somewhere in the future, but we just want to be super careful about it because we, we talk to other business owners all the time. And so we get a sense that, you know, of the risk of opening a second location and losing your magic, you know, and we want to be <laughs> really careful about that. that makes a lot of sense. My sister's a business owner and I always ask her about a second location. She's, oh, she runs, or she owns monkeys of the Westin. It's a clothing store in Weston Greenville yeah and she I always ask her about opening the second location she's like this is my baby I gotta make sure this runs the best yeah. it can which you know makes a lot of sense what is an item on the menu that you think maybe is a little out there that people should try well our vegan sandwiches are they're really amazing like we put there's like a lot of ingredients in them and they're really special and when people try them, I feel like they do rave about them. Um, and so I would say that is something where like people might be more hesitant to try if they're here for the first time or they don't know about it. And then usually generally once they do, even if they're not avoiding meat or anything or dairy, like it's pretty filling and they're they love it. Good. Like right now, 
Yeah, it has a beet hummus in it that we make in-house and it has some nuts, you know, some good protein and a slaw and it looks really beautiful. So it's very Instagrammable. Um, <laughs> but I would say that if you were coming here and you wanted to try something a little bit not as popular as the turkey pesto, like that could be a good option. Mm-hmm. Mine's <laughs> always the grilled cheese and greens. So it's pretty simple and delicious. Yeah, I had a phase where I ate that every day. It's a good one too. It makes <laughs> you feel good about eating the grilled cheese. I know it's so good. Um, I think my wife, she'll get the grilled cheese and just add like turkey or ham or something. So she'll yeah. add some meat to it too. Is there, where do you source your coffee? So we get it from counterculture. Oh, cool. um, yeah. And when we opened, like within our first year, um, speaking of customer support, like we had two really good customers. And they would do our, they, they were really also passionate about supporting local farmers. They would do all their grocery shopping here and totally in a supportive way. They were really into coffee and they would help us troubleshoot our espresso machine, help us like learn little tricks about pulling the perfect shot. And <laughs> um, they were urging us like, hey, you should try Counterculture. Um, they're a great company. Um, and so we've been working with them for about 10 years and we're just, we love their transparency with sourcing um and farmers and paying a fair price and all that stuff so that's really important to us very good and i do love y'all have so many unique drinks whether it be like a soft drink or just like a flavored water or flavored seltzer like all these sort of different drinks you guys have for somebody on the street and they've never met mary and they ask what do you do like how do you describe swamp rabbit cafe and what y'all do there I would say we're, we're a small local business with the mission to support small local farmers and food makers. Um, that would be like the first sentence, but yeah. I know we're so much more than that. And I always compare us to, to like, the, there's a huge difference if you're going to a conventional big box grocer than here. Like, I think here, you, you know, over there, you know, at a conventional store, there's a giant parking lot in a giant store everything you could want super low prices and you want to get in and out um and that's the experience and i think here you know we see people running into their neighbors here or even family members running into each other like you'll see signs with the pictures of all the makers here um and i think the big difference too is when we bring in products like we care a lot about where it comes from and if we find that a product is made with bad ingredients or doesn't have a great story behind it, like we take all that stuff into account. So I think it's, you know, you come full circle with the experience and you see your vendors shopping there with you or eating here. Um, keep our, you know, keep our money in our community, you know, rather than, you know, finding cheap products that comes at the expense of someone else somewhere, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. And you're so right. Like every time I'm there, I always see somebody else I know um, also there. And I do love, did y'all build that playpen out front for like yeah. the kids? Yeah. And that I always, I forgot about that, but like we always use that as an example of obviously that's something that sets us apart, but um, we built it because we were working and had babies, young children, and you know, we needed a way for them to be contained so we could work. And so it started out as just a fence to contain babies. People started bringing toys and then it kind of just grew from there. And so now sometimes we refer to it as the misfit toy garden uh, because it's people's like unwanted toys, but they're still perfectly fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's like a passive playground and you don't have to worry about people like climbing up or, you know, and doing things like that. Yeah, it's Uh, awesome. I was there with, yeah, two friends of mine that have two two young ones and yeah I mean it was perfect they were able to run around and play and we were able to enjoy each other's company and eat some good food so I mean it works out perfect yeah and you know parking it is a big struggle for us and we know that we lose business because we don't have a great parking situation Mm -hmm. um and probably if we were to be more businessy people we'd probably run numbers and find that you know paving over that area and adding parking spaces would benefit us financially but it's really important that we aren't just a giant parking lot, you know, in, in a store. Like we want people to interact with each other. I think that's really great for people and for the community. Yeah. And like you said, if people come in at the very beginning, people coming down the trail, 
Um, I mean, it's a perfect place to be able to, if you have your kids in the stroller or have your kids on the back of your bike, that sort of thing, you can always rely on having it there for your kids. And you know what? I know every time I pull in there, yeah, it's difficult. Like parking is difficult, but you know what? If you figure it, you figure it out. Like the, I think the customers that enjoy it and love it so much, figure it out anyways. So um, I want to thank you and Jack for putting y'all's idea into motion and creating the Swamp Rabbit Cafe because being a Greenville native, I mean, I love it and I love having it in the community um, and y'all have done such an amazing job with it. And I mean, I know y'all are going to continue to do more and more with it. And if you haven't and you're listening, please go visit Mary at Swamp Rabbit Cafe and enjoy all the tasty treats and drinks that we've talked about. Mary, do you have anything else to say or, or kind of end it on a certain note? Oh, I don't know. That one caught me off guard. I don't know. Well, we're at the end of the year and it's always a good time where we, well, we're really busy and um, we're coming off of like Thanksgiving, which we call the Super Bowl for grocery stores and for bakers. Um, <laughs> so we, we had a really busy week and now we have like the last three weeks of the year, but it's always a great time to reflect and like we, we just grow in our appreciation for our staff because they work so hard. They made like hundreds and hundreds of pies. And um, especially this Thanksgiving, um, last week, our chef got a karaoke machine and he was singing in the kitchen to help pump everyone up. And customers were coming and saying, you guys are so organized this year. Um, so I just think they're, they're just like, as busy as we are, there's also like a notable increase in the good feelings and the positivity. So I'm just looking forward to a good December and you know good 2023 too yeah 2023 and, and on that note of thanksgiving we got our mac and cheese from you guys and we got the chocolate chess pie from you guys too oh those are like two hits yes. i hope you like them <laughs> oh they're the best the chocolate chess pie is amazing um we are in charge of the mac and cheese this year and we have tried to make it from scratch in the past and it was never as good as y'all so we were like you know what we're just gonna <laughs> order it from you guys <laughs> Well, thank you. Well, thank you for coming on. I can't wait for people to hear it. Um, like I said at the beginning, I've loved y'all's story. I've loved to see the the evolution of Swamp Rabbit Cafe from the early days. And it's really just such an important thing for the community. I'll make sure to have all your info in the show notes so people can find you guys. If people listen from out of town, they can come check you out. Um, but thank you for coming on. And it has been a pleasure talking with you.